Let's go to John 15, verse 1. God is love. God is love. God is love. God is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8 says, God is love. Because love comes from God. And this is an important, important part about his attribute. He loves only those who remain in his love. God is love. But he only loves those who remain in in his love. So there's condition to his love. So this is why we need to really pay attention to who God is, as the Bible suggests. Because you've heard that God is love many times in many places, and even in religions, philosophies, and worldly teachings, they all talk about love. So as you sit there and sit here, God is love, you can say, oh, this is my favorite topic, and uh, I've heard this before, God is love. But the part you really need to pay attention is that, yes, he loves, but he loves only those who remain in his love. So when we have faith in God who is love, it's um, the state of remaining in his love. When you have faith in God, it means that you remain in his love. The state of remaining in his love is the state of having faith in him. So it is not just to say, Lord, Lord, with your lips and giving lip service, but it is to remain in his love. And certainly I will explain what remaining in his love means. If we have this faith, then we have to live this faith by uh, being supported, uh, being supported by him. That's our faith life, being supported by him, being supplied by him, receiving his um, supplication, his support um, that allows me then to bear fruit. Being supported by him means to that it means that it allow he allows me to bear fruit. What's the point if we don't bear fruit? So we are supported by him and we bear fruit, only then we can arrive in the kingdom of the Son he loves. Colossians chapter one, verse thirteen describes the kingdom of heaven as the kingdom of the Son, the Son of God, whom he loves. How many of you want to enter the kingdom of God in that day? The kingdom that is filled with his love. Do you want to go there? Until we arrive there, because we're not there yet, we need to live this faith life, which is to bear fruit. How do we bear fruit? By being supported by him, receiving his support, receiving uh, his supplies. I have been speaking to you and sharing with you um, message or messages and ideas about sowing and reaping seed seeds uh, and bearing fruit and today is the last message in the series of um, bearing fruit so uh, last week I talked about the fruit of the spirit which should have shocked you and embarrassed you it wasn't to make you feel good I get the feeling some of you didn't quite get the message but then there are those who really got the message and shared with me uh, when I visited a group this past week and said they were so embarrassed they wanted to hide that was the right attitude to hear that message, the, the fruit of the spirit. Because it really gets to the personal part of who I am is that I'm really not there at all. I want to bear the fruit. Do you want to bear the fruit of your womb? Even if I'm not talking about your physical womb, and you've already figured that out. I'm talking about spiritual wombs. We all have spiritual womb to bear fruit through our lives. Amen. It is our desire, I believe, especially if you have been in the church for a while and if you have position in the church, you definitely want to bear fruit. But you've heard last week, you cannot bear fruit unless you change your character, your words. The word that you carelessly spit out without thinking can risk your fruit. So that's why we're left in embarrassment and shame and even despair. But we don't end there. The word of God is always encouraging and optimistic. And today, uh, we need to find out and learn more about his love and what it means to bear fruit um, by his love, through his love. It is by remaining in his love. Now, love uh, has an important characteristic that is about the desire to be with, the desire to be with. So if you love someone, uh, plainly it means you want to be with them, whether it's your um, parents, your sibling, your children, um, or that loved one in your life, you want to be with that person or those people. That's 
uh, the important part of what love is. Um, but the sad reality of uh, mankind or uh, the human life is that there's limit to how much you can be with someone. Um, yes, there is death that separates us finally. But even, there, uh, even if you don't get as far as death, there's something called sleep. Once you sleep, there's no more love. It's just you're out. You know, like the night right, right before, all the guys are laughing, um, because, or the husbands are laughing. So until you fall asleep, you're chit-chatting. It's like, yeah, yeah, you know this guy, like, love you, I love you, I love you. And then, bam, out. It's just like, hello, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? And they're out. So completely out. Um, and when they're out, even though they're not dead, certainly they're living, breathing. You can hear them breathe really loud. Um, somehow that emotion of love or the expression of love is no va not valid. It's not effective anymore because sleep just cuts off that state of being together. Um, but certainly the greatest sadness for, uh, for man is death. So even if you want to keep someone close to you uh, till death, till death do us apart, as people make vows um, as they get married, uh, we tend to see death as uh, the end of all. And it is true in this world. Death is what ends all our relationships, uh, our loving relationship. And once the person is dead, you cannot be with them anymore. Even if right up until their last breath, you held them to their body and you wept and you showed your love for that person, the moment their breath is cut off, you don't keep holding that body anymore. You have to let it go. Uh, you may weep over the body for a few minutes or maybe even a few hours, but then the body has to now go to the morgue and eventually to the ground. Because once the spirit leaves, your love also leaves, and that's uh, the greatest sadness uh, in life. But with God, all things are possible. So when Jesus says, remain in me, I in you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. This is only possible with God because God is love, who is spirit and eternal, and his love is therefore spiritual and eternal. Therefore, remaining in him and he remaining in us eternally is possible only with God. And the relationship um, based on this kind of love is a relationship between a tree and its branches. So that's what we just read in John 15. Just so to note, uh, uh, this book, the book of John, is sort of like the heart of the Bible. And chapter 15 is like the heart of hearts of the Bible. Of course, every word, every chapter, every book is about Jesus, therefore it's important. But if you want to really understand the heart of God, heart, the heart of Jesus, you go to John 15. And right there, as you read over and over again, um, having heard the sermon, Go home and read 15 over and over again, you would start to feel his heart uh, pumping. You know, the, the heartbeat of our God uh, can be felt in this chapter. So Jesus said, I am the true vine. I am the vine. You are the branches. In verse 5, he continues, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. So the relationship between a vine and branches is um, that of life. So for branches to live, any of the branches to live, the branch must remain attached to the vine at all cost. Whatever it takes, the branch must hold on to the vine, even, even if the wind is blowing at 100 miles per hour, like in a Hurricane Sandy or whatever, uh, in a super storm. The, the branch has to have this determination to hold onto the vine no matter what because the moment it falls away, it dies. So the function, the duty of the branch is to remain attached to the vine. Now, when the branch is attached to the vine, then the gardener is interested in the branch. There are three parties mentioned here. There's the vine, there's the branch, and there's the gardener. The branch and the vine are, are about life, but the gardener is slightly different. The, slight, uh, gar the gardener has an interest in the fruit, and as long as the, the branch is attached to the vine, then the gardener takes care of the branch. But the moment the branch falls away from the vine, then the gardener will pick it up and throw it to the fire. 
So for the branch to receive love from the gardener, it must be attached to the vine. And the proof that it is attached to the vine is its fruit. Without fruit, there's no proof that it's remaining alive attached to the vine. So this is why it's so important for us to understand our relationship with the Lord as the vine and us, we as his branches, the branches. Amen? So I'm a branch. Let's see it together. I'm a branch. We are the branches. And who is the true vine? Jesus is the true vine. The Father God is the gardener. Now, to reveal his love and give his love, uh, God made man to be a living being. So God made man from the dust of the ground, and into such man God breathed his breath, which is spirit. And the man became a spiritual being living inside the flesh. Together, it's called, uh, he's called a living uh, being. And this living being was named Adam. And Adam lived in an environment full of God's blessing and love called the Garden of Eden. And chapter 2 of Genesis describes how abundant this place it, uh, was and how uh, vibrant and, and, and filled with life it was. So it, um, from the garden, when uh, four river heads bearing multiple fruits and uh, filling up uh, with life. So the garden sounds like a paradise. Uh, and that's where Adam lived. But um, he was given the word to live by, the word of God, which said, uh, do not eat from one tree. Speaking of trees, God said you can eat from any trees in the garden, but there's only one tree that you must not eat from, not even look at, not touch, and it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, if you eat of it, what will happen? You will surely die. So God spoke to the spirit uh, part of the man, but the man was deceived later on by a serpent that was also in the garden. So the serpent approached Eve and, and then the man and said, you can eat the fruit. The reason why God doesn't want you eat, to eat the fruit is that if you eat of it, you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Imagine that. You don't need his uh, support. You can have it all yourself. And the moment the man was deceived, he took the fruit that was forbidden but what happened was he had sinned against God when he broke the word of God. So sin entered man, the spirit man. And to show this in physical reality, God banished Adam and Eve out of the garden. And at the end of Genesis chapter 3, verse 24, and on, we see that God puts a flaming sword around the garden. And do you know why uh, God did that? He, put a, uh, he, played, uh, he placed this flaming sword. We know that it's, uh, that's angel. And that was to prevent man from coming back to the garden. So the garden became hidden forever from our eyes. So there is no such thing as Garden of Eden anymore. It's, it's taken away from man. It's hidden away from man. But not only that, the flaming sword represents the broken relationship between God and man. What kind of relationship? relationship. Why? What broke it? What broke it? Sin. Sin is the state of being separated from God. Did you get that? What's the definition of sin? It's the state of being separated from God. So it is not, it's not what you do that's sin, but sin is the state of being separated from God. And the patterns, the symptoms are what you do. You see, there's a slight difference. So sin is referring to the state of being separated from God, being broken away from God because of sin. But we see that throughout the history of the Bible thereafter, God makes an effort to call men, to reveal them his love, and to love them. Um, in Matthew chapter 1, uh, verse 1 to 16, uh, there are many names listed by generation. And it goes all the way from Abraham to Jesus. And it's called the genealogy of Jesus Christ. So Jesus comes upon these, uh, these characters throughout the history of the Bible. And what's unique about these names that are mentioned in Matthew 1 are they're the people of the Old Testament, most of them, and they were the people of faith, and they were the ones who received God's love. God was very interested in these people and these people alone. So God is love, but his love actually differentiates. Yes. He's not all loving. Yes, he loves the world, and that's why he, do, he did a wonderful thing and a such precious thing like sending his son to the world. But we see that at the same time, his love uh, is for certain people, that he chooses 
certain people over others to show his love. So God called on a man named Abraham. There were many men who lived um, in, uh, in that part of the world at the time, which we call now the Middle East, the Arabic world, whatever. But it was only one man that God chose, and his name was Abram. Everyone else he didn't care for, but he cared for Abram. So God gave him promise, and God made him a covenant with him for blessing, and that God said, through your descendants... Uh, the Son of God will come, that he will return to him in line. So God showed great interest in Abraham, and because of that, Abraham was able to carry out um, the task of obeying his command of leaving his land and later sacrificing his only son, whom he bore at the age of 100, because God showed him interest. Then his son Isaac, the one that was almost killed by his own father, uh, it was the one that God was interested while there was another son to Abraham, right? Who was the other son? Ishmael. So uh, Muslims think that the lineage of, uh, of God or the covenant of God continued not through Isaac, but Ishmael. So uh, Ishmael was important to Islam. However, in the Bible, it is Isaac that God chooses over Ishmael. And Ishmael, even though... He was born uh, having uh, the connection to Abraham. He was actually kicked out of his home and almost died in the desert. Uh, of course, God took care of him, his mother, in the desert. But they become a people they, uh, who are not blessed, rather cursed, because they are not the descendants of Isaac. Only Isaac was blessed and was shown God's interest. From Isaac comes, come two sons. What were their names? Anyone know? Esau and Jacob. Well, I hear if I can just say, you know, I go to Poland a lot, and then the Polish people, we have this conversation. They were like, you know, they, they say, they heard some Korean. They say, all oh, the Korean, you know, we, all we hear from the Koreans is, mm, 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 mm. and then I say, yeah, you know what I hear from you guys? <laughs> so, <laughs> right, Marek? Yeah. So all the Polish, you just add sh to it, and that's it. It's like, all the names, Lukash, Tomash, sh, sh. Okay, so. Uh, don't be, I know you're not speaking Polish, all right? So no, sh right now. So you mean Jacob. Okay, so Esau and Jacob, they're the twins. Esau is the older and Jacob is the younger. But God said to Rebecca, their mother, when she was, cons uh, when she was pregnant with them, the, he said to her, God said to her, the younger will serve, younger will be served by the older. Young, the younger will be blessed and the older will be cursed. In the eyes of the older, this is unfair, but God is not socially fair God. He is love, and he loves only those who remain in his love. It's the way he is. We can't imagine God to be like this buffoon or Santa Claus that we imagine. He's not like that. God is not a Santa Claus. God, ha God is his own person. He has his own attributes, and he is love who loves those who remain in his love. Amen. So he chooses Jacob over Esau to continue his lineage of blessing and his love. And later, from Jacob come how many sons? Quickly, how many sons come from Jacob? Twelve, and they become the twelve tribes of Israel. And the oldest son of uh, Jacob was named Reuben. So Reuben was the eldest son, but if you know the history of the Bible, the lineage continues not through Reuben, but Judah. So to Reuben, this is not fair. Reuben said, I'm the firstborn. The rule was the firstborn gets to continue the lineage. But God says, I'm the one who established it. I'm going to break it as I want. It's going to be through Judah. So to Reuben, it's not fair. But it doesn't matter what men think is fair. It only, it only matters what God wants. Amen. So we see that there is interest that God has, and the history of the Bible continues this way. So what happens to the rest of the people that he is not interested in? They fade away. They're cursed, and they fade away. Only those that God is interested in, shows his love in, continue the history of faith. So this is why we need to pay attention. Where, where am I lined up? Which line am I in? The one with God's interest or not? It's one or the other. So when God chose Jacob, Jacob was given the name Israel because from him a nation would come. So the 12 tribes of Israel become the nation of Israel. And God chooses the people of Israel over other peoples on earth. So you can say, well, it's not fair. Our people in China, we have the biggest number of people. It doesn't matter. Yeah, you could have been as, around as long as these other people, but God chose only one people. 
call the people of Israel. And God chose them to reveal his interest in them and love in them. Now, when he called them, God gave them his law to reveal himself. And the law has many, many, many commandments. Don't do this. Do not do this. Do not do that. Do this, but don't do that. So it was a lot of do's and don'ts of 613 points. And for about 15 to 1,700 years, the Jews had to keep the law to live. Because if they didn't keep the law, they were punished to death. Now, the law, even though it had many, many commandments, as someone asked Jesus in Matthew 20 to 26, 26 on, Jesus, they asked, what is the greatest command, commandment? Right? There are many commandments, but what is the greatest? So Jesus tells us what the greatest commandment is, which summarizes all the commandments of God. So what, are, what is the greatest commandment? Anyone know? Two, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, strength, or different uh, uh, translation you're looking at. So what is it plainly? To love the Lord your God. All together, to love the Lord your God because he loved you first and he chose you. He, gave, he made covenant with no other people but your people. He built the sanctuary in no other place but your, uh, in your midst, in the midst of your people. God built his house, his dwelling place, the sanctuary where the law was placed, where his name was. So the people of Israel understood, as long as the temple was in their midst, that God's love was for them. And they were to keep the commandments because they loved the Lord. So you see, if you love the Lord, you would keep all the commandments to all the 613 points. If you break the law, it means you don't love the Lord. And then you are punished. So even though they were selected among all the peoples and received God's love exclusively, it was yet conditional. It was conditional to their obedience uh, and their following uh, of the law. So Jesus, the, who called himself the Son of God, came to the world, came to Jerusalem, and looked at this temple of Jerusalem. And what did he say that these Jews got very upset about and ended up killing him in the end? What did Jesus say? Destroy this temple. Jesus was looking at the temple that they consider as the expression of the love of God for them. And in turn, they were to love him and said, destroy it. So again, imagine the people of Israel who took pride. To this day, they take pride. That's why they're still sitting there in Jerusalem and claiming it as their own land. And they're going to put another temple up because this means the love of God in their midst. So when, the, when Jesus had destroyed, the Jews understood as challenge, even blasphemy. Uh, against God. But what Jesus was speaking of was the temple of his body. Altogether, the temple of his body. Jesus was talking about the temple of his body. He was saying, I'm going to die, but in three days I will be risen to life. Now, what was Jesus going to accomplish through his death and his resurrection? Anyone know? Think about it. What's the attribute of God? He is love. Now, if Jesus, the Son of God, came to the world to die and be resurrected, what was he going to reveal? How was he going to reveal the attribute of God? The love of God. Not just for the Jews or the flesh, but the souls of all men. Hallelujah. Jesus was going to lay down his life willingly. And through his death, he would reveal the love of God, not for the Jews, not for the flesh and blood, but for their spirit, the souls of all men. That's why Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not, shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world. Now, this is a different God, isn't it? Because in the Old Testament, God only loved selectively, exclusively. But then here's Jesus saying, God, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, one and only son. So when Jesus said the world, he was referring to the souls of all men. And he came as a descendant of David, this genealogy of God's love. Jesus came. Now, when Jesus began to do his work as the Son of God, we call this the public life of Christ, of Jesus, because he did not live all 30 years of his life doing the work of God. He was living as a regular guy for about 30 years. But in the 30th year, he was baptized by John, and he received the Holy Spirit, and that, was, that marked the beginning of his ministry uh, years up until his death. 
Now, when he began his life as the son of God, there was a support from heaven. He had to receive the heavenly support, the divine support to do the work of the father. When he went on the water and came out, you know, this was John baptizing Jesus, there was a confirmation from heaven. There was heavenly support. What was that? There was a voice from heaven that said, this is my son. My son whom I love. This is my son whom I love. There were other men lined up to be baptized by John at the time, but only when Jesus came out of the water, there was voice from heaven saying, this is my son whom I love. So right there we see God, the father, showing his love for the son, and the son receiving his love as his support that he needs to do the work of the father from that point on. So what work was he going to do? Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28, the Son of Man did not come to the world to be served, but to serve by giving his life as a ransom. What was Jesus going to do? He was going to serve, but by what? Giving his life as a ransom. Let's go to also John 10. What did Jesus say in John 10, 17? John 10, 17 to 18. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life, only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. So in Matthew 20, 28, Jesus was saying that he was going to die as a ransom for many sinners, all sinners. But here in John 10, 17, still talking about his own death. But now he's highlighting the reason why he's going to die. The reason why he's going to die is that he was willingly laying down his life. Why? Because this is the command that the Father gave him. And Jesus said confidently, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. Now, is there any doubt in that statement? Did Jesus have any doubt in in his understanding of the Father's love for him? No. There was not even a moment in his life, even to the point of dying on the cross, that he doubted ever the Father's love for him. So he said, the reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life. I lay it down willingly because this is a command that I received from my Father. And as we read in John 15, verse 9, Jesus said again there, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So many times Jesus uh, repeated, The Father loves me, so I love you. The Father loves me, so I'm able to do his work. So he was always confident of the love of the Father for him to the point of laying down his life and laying down willingly and joyfully. Now, when he began his work as the Son of God, he began by calling men to become his disciples. If you go back to John 15, verse 12 and 17, Jesus said, My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Let's read 14. You are my friends... Go ahead. You are my friends if you do what I command. Once again, you are my friends if you do what I command. And then he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you together so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Here, we see the purpose of the calling of disciples. Jesus called his disciples to be with him. Another place Jesus said, he called the 12 to be with him. But not to be with him forever, but to be with him and then be sent out. Sent out. And here it says to be sent out to do what? To bear fruit. To be sent out to bear fruit. To bear fruit means you have, the, you have the evidence that you are his disciple. And who are his disciples? His friends. Jesus called his disciples his friends. You are my friend. 
Jesus. Who is Jesus? Was he, is he just another man? He's not just another man. He is God who came in the flesh. He is the incarnate word. He is the God who is from the beginning to the end, who was and is and is to come. Amen. He is the one who was the word with the Father in the beginning, as John 1 indicates. But he came as man to dwell among men. John 1.14 says that. And when he would he dwell among men, he called men to be with him to make him make them his disciples, the 12 of them, and call them his disciples. Because disciples know, disciples as friends, will know all the things that Jesus knows. That's what the definition of disciple is. Have no secret, right? Friendship means having no secret. That's what disciples are. And it says, you are my friends if you do what I command. If you don't do what I command, you're not my friend. That's what Jesus is saying. But Jesus clearly indicated greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. Who is Jesus talking about? Himself. No greater love than this, that a friend lays down his life. Someone lays down his life for his friends. So Jesus went to the cross. Without defending himself, without trying to prove his innocence, Jesus died in silence. But he let out a cry that said, it is finished. The moment Jesus died was the moment he revealed the Father's love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says, this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. The moment Jesus died was the moment he laid down his life willingly and joyfully because this is the moment he came to the he came to the world for to reveal who God is to honor God for who he is and who is God he is love and what kind of love does he give what kind of love comes from him the love that comes from him is not for flesh and blood as the old testament people understood but the love that God has is for the souls of all men to the point of sending his own son who is God to die as an atoning sacrifice for their sins. That's why Jesus also in John 17, 23, as he prayed, the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Jesus never doubted that the Father loved him. And because he never doubted, he laid down his life confidently. He did not fear that he's going to end up in hell, dead. But he knew that even if he laid down his life 100%, that the Father's love will rescue him from death. Hallelujah. It was the moment the Son trusted in the love of the Father and, and revealed to the world who the Father is, that the Father is love. Hallelujah. And through that sacrifice, his death, Jesus condemned the devil, the origin of sin, ho diabolos. The devil means ho diabolos in Greek, and diabolos is someone who separates. He is the one who separated men from God in the beginning. But Jesus showed what true love is, and at the sight of just true love of God, the devil was condemned. And for Jesus loved the souls of all men, he shed his blood to redeem their sins. And what Jesus became was he became a tree of blood. Jesus became a tree, a vine that is of blood. He became the blood vine. Jesus, by shedding his blood through his torn flesh, became the blood of vine, the blood tree, to which all the souls of men can be grafted onto. We were all born receiving and inheriting sin in our spirit. Because when Adam was made as living being, we all came from him and became living being, whether we knew it or not. And when Adam sinned, our ancestor, sin entered his spirit, Sin entered my spirit too. I did not know it, 
But the Bible says so. And by receiving the law and trying to keep the law, I find myself to be breaking the law, that I'm a sinner. Not just by what I'm doing, but in my spirit is sin. And sin caused death. I was dead in sin. This became the reality for all men because we are like branches attached to one vine called Adam, the first Adam. But this first Adam, when he sinned against God, died. So it became a dead vine because of sin. But a new vine came to the world, died on another kind of tree called the cross, was broken and spilled out to become the blood vine so that dead branches like us can be broken off from the dead vine and now be grafted onto a new vine called Jesus. Do you know what grafting is? This is what farmers do. You know, when you have hybrid fruit, hybrid vegetables, you can cut the vine and attach to another, the branch to another vine. And there is something called this, this really sticky stuff that stick together. Sometimes you have to reinforce it with mud or some kind of, you know, binding um, mechanism to keep them together. Like your body, tissues can be grafted on to a dead area of your body to give life. And Romans 11 describes that as well, 20 through 24, that you have been grafted onto a new olive tree. And that olive tree is talking about the blood vine that Jesus became so that all men can be now grafted onto him and live. Hallelujah. Though we were once dead in sin, we have a chance to be born again, receive new life, called the blood of Jesus. And through his blood, we can be attached to the blood vine called Jesus. Hallelujah. That's what he accomplished through his death on the cross. And when he did, he fulfilled the Father's will. So in three days, the Father raised him from the grave. His resurrection is the proof of the Father's love for him. Just as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Just as the Father loved me, so have I loved you. Jesus always knew the love of the Father for him. And therefore, he was able to love all men including the ones who killed him. But the father raised him up to prove his love for him, and Jesus ascended to the throne in heaven. When he entered that place, that heavenly place, as Colossians 1.13 says, this is the kingdom of the Son whom God loves, and that kingdom in heaven is filled with his love. There is no hatred, no anger, no resentment, no guilt, only love, the love of the Father for the Son and the love, the love of the Son for the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From there, he sent the Holy Spirit, not to the world, but to those who have received his love. Those who have called upon his name, believe in his name. In John 1, 12, says they have received the right to become the children of God. The moment we believe in his name is the moment we receive his blood. Say amen. If you believe, you, believe, you receive the blood of Jesus. Amen. Have you believed in his name? As what? You believe in his name, Jesus, or Yeshua. As what? The name of God, the name of the Father who loves. When I receive his blood, the Holy Spirit comes in my soul to testify the Father's love for me. Who is my Father? Who is our Father in heaven? He is the one who gave birth to me in his blood. Whose blood do you have? The blood of Jesus, the blood of Yeshua. Amen? So when you say, our Father in heaven, my Father in heaven, who do you think of? It is Yeshua, who is in heaven, who still has marks on his body that testify his love for us. Hallelujah. And the Holy Spirit comes, as Romans 8.15 says, testifies that we have received his love so that we will no longer doubt his love. Now, when we say we love the Lord, as you're saying, I love you, Jesus. You've given me life. I love you, Jesus. We say we love the Lord, and I certainly love the Lord. However, I don't see him. 
I've never seen him with my naked eyes. I've never touched him. He's, I, I've never had this physical experience witnessing him or being next to him. I still have faith. I need faith to even love him. You see, while we are in the flesh, we still need a component called faith to love him. But when we go to the kingdom of his love, we don't need faith. See, faith, love, hope. And out of them, the most important thing is love. Why does it say that? We need faith while we are in the flesh because we don't see him. We need hope because we're not there yet. But love will always be, even after we don't need faith and we don't need hope. Because the kingdom of the son he loves is filled with the love of God. Hallelujah. Amen. Then who is a Christian? The true Christian knows that he's a branch that belongs to the tree, the blood tree of Jesus, the blood vine of Jesus. The man of the spirit, the true Christian, does not doubt in the love of the Father because he has the blood of Jesus flowing in him. Not because someone is telling him and brainwashing him, remember, God loves you. It's okay, your life is horrible, but God still loves you. Okay, he loves me, he loves me, he loves me. That's not how it happens. It is to know that in, deep inside your soul, regardless of what you have done in your flesh, what's going on in your flesh, regardless of that, that deep in your soul is the blood that you receive from this vine and that you are a branch now attached to this vine to live. Amen? So now I have a relationship with him as my true vine, the blood vine. And I'm a blood branch. Blood. There's nothing more real than blood. In blood there's life. In blood there's death. So blood is the most serious you can get in terms of showing your love. So the relationship that I have with the vine is an unbreakable relationship. No one can separate us from his love. Hallelujah. Because the blood of Jesus is a spirit blood. No one can cut that away from me. No one can take that away from me. Amen. So the man who believes that he is a branch attached to the blood vine called Jesus remains in his love. Remember, I said God is love, and he loves only those who remain in his love. What does it mean to remain in his love? Jesus said in verse 9 to 10, John 15, Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love. How do we remain in his love? By keeping his commands. <laughs> in the Old Testament, People kept commands, the commandments of God out of fear. Even though they knew that their people were loved by God, they kept the law because of fear, fear of losing their life. But now we understand the love of God that has come for us and died in our place to show us his perfect love. So now we choose to remain in his love by keeping his commands. His commands. So to come into worship, which is his command, we come not by force, but out of love. But if you come late, you come sit there and fall asleep, check your phone, and think about something else. You're not remaining in his love. You may be remaining in a seat in a building on 30 West Glen Avenue in Paramus, but that's not remaining in his love. We do it willingly, out of love, to keep his command. So what does keeping command look like? Keeping the command of Christ and remaining his love look like? First, it is to absolutely hold on to the blood tree, to absolutely hold on to the blood vine at all costs. I need to hang on, hang on to the vine, because if I fall away, I will die. If you look at a vine, a grape vine, the vine grows horizontally. It's a very interesting tree. You know, everything else grows vertically. But the grapevine goes horizontally. It's got many thin branches, and then they go like horizontally this way. So the branch, 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 branch. So they all spread out horizontally, and that's who we are. We are blood vines hanging onto the vine. And when we hang onto the vine, fruit comes from my life. 
and the from fruit comes another branch, another branch, another branch. We hang on to each other because this is a matter of life and death. Second, remaining in his love, has, even though a branch may have no appearance or glory of his own, he has fruit. What is the value of a branch is not in the way it looks. As I told you, the grapevine does not look so pretty. You know, we, maybe we don't get to see around here, but like I, when I go to Europe, we drive through the streets and, and the hills. Some places we see grapevines, a lot of them, and they look so skinny, you know, really skinny and even really, really thin and very unattractive in some way. But that's not the value of a branch to look attractive. If it doesn't have fruit, it has no worth of living. So it must be cut down and thrown into the fire. Doesn't matter how much wealth one has or how much education or talent one has. It doesn't matter how glamorous your career is or how perfect your family looks like if you don't have fruit. Your value, your worth is in your fruit. What the, what the gardener wants is fruit. What the vine wants is fruit. What the branch should want is also fruit. So what is the fruit that I need to bear? It's like a vine holding onto the, 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 the branch and branch holding onto the vine. I need to hold on to the souls given to me at all cost. All cost. It's not to give up. The souls that I meet at work on the street, these are souls given to me. Souls given to me through the church as I lead souls. These are souls given to me. Have you hung unto them, held unto them with all your life? Because you haven't, you have lost them. There's no fruit. You pray for them because you want to hold on to them. Without prayer, you cannot hold on to them. The Holy Spirit will not do it for you. You have to do it for the fruit yourself. Then the Holy Spirit supplies. A branch, a true branch, third, is only interested in the work that bears fruit. We have to be very smart about how we are spent. You ask somebody, why are you so tired? Oh, because I'm so overworked at work. I'm working overtime. Or I have school assignment. I'm so tired. I don't have time to come to church anymore. I can't pray because I have projects. Or like, I'm so busy helping my friends and my family. I'm so tired I can't pray. What kind of work is that? Is that to bear fruit? We have to be spent for the work that bears fruit. You only have one body and one life to live. How are you spending that body and that life and that energy? Is it for your emotional carnal needs? or some altruistic purpose, so you can feel good about yourself, or doing some charity work, or social, helping the social cause of your, of your times, of your society. No, it is to be spent for the work that bears fruit. Fourth, the true branch passes down its sap. The branch doesn't produce the sap. The sap comes from the root, from the vine. The sap is the juice that we depend on. What's the juice? The word of the truth. Nothing added, nothing taken away. That's the definition of the truth. We don't alter it no matter what. Even if people leave and because they can't understand the word. It's too much, too hard, too irrelevant. Some people tell me that too. They're like, look at all these people. They're so young and immature. Do you think you should be preaching like that? Yes, that's what I hear, folks. I'm, I'm, I sometimes hear that from people. Look around the room. Do you think they understand anything you're saying? Yeah, and I think about that too. I don't think they do. So what should I be preaching for? Be good children of your parents? Be hard workers and good citizens? No. I must speak about the truth, and that is the truth of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Nothing added, nothing taken away, because my role, my duty as a branch is to pass it down. Fifth, a branch walks and lives with the tree goes wherever the tree goes and receives whatever the tree receives, whether it's suffering or glory. It's Romans 17, 18. Now, if we are children, we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. If Jesus cried, I must cry. If Jesus pray, I must pray. If Jesus was persecuted, I must be persecuted. You understand? I have to live the same life as Jesus. 
But people say, well, Jesus suffered for me, so I need to have a good life. Where does this come from? The suffering of Christ, I must join him. And then one day, I will receive the glory that he received. And when a branch does this, then the gardener helps the branch by supporting him. How does the gardener support his branches? First, by cleansing. The gardener cleanses us. Jesus said in John 15, 2, he, while every branch that does bear fruit, the gardener prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. He's pruning us when we bear fruit. What does pruning mean? He's cleansing us through repentance. Repentance is what we do about the sins we commit, but it's absolutely necessary for God to help us to repent. Because we see people who say they are repenting, they're fasting, but when God does not help them, that repentance is no use. Who is the one who's going to be working in your life to remember all the sins that you have said and done? Because you could have jabbed people all day long. Next morning comes, you don't feel guilty about any of that if God is not helping you. You spit out all the words so carelessly in your texts and words and however you do it. You just jab people with your words that you carelessly spit out. Who's going to convict you about those words you spit out? It's God, the Holy Spirit. I feel that. You know, I, I, I turn around and go, why did I say it like that? Well, I should have been more patient. I should have been more loving. I should have just waited. This tongue, this temper. Only by his help I can repent. Repentance, sanctification. He helps me become sanctified, keeping the word. He lets me surrender my worldly things, worldly dreams, and worldly wealth, and worldly plans. He lets me surrender. You know why people can't surrender? It's because God's not helping them. You just feel guilty and can't do it because God doesn't help you. Why doesn't God help you? Because you have no fruit. You're not bearing fruit, so he doesn't help. So you can't surrender. You keep holding on to things that you should let go. How else does he help the branch? He helps us by continually supplying answers to our prayers, spiritual inspiration, and giving us the word and life through the word. Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you as long as you are fruitful. And lastly, the Father will hold on to the branch until the end. As long as the branch is bearing fruit, when the Lord comes back, they will be lifted up to the air, remaining intact to the body of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, it says, We will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will be with the Lord forever. Do you want to be with the Lord forever? Do you want to see Jesus in that day? Then you have to know that you are a branch grafted unto the blood vine. And if so, you need to be desperate for fruit. To have a proof that you are his disciple, that you are his friends. And at all costs, this must be your priority. Every morning, every day you wake up, I want to be fruitful. I want to bear fruit. Let me die more so I can bear fruit. If we have truly learned the love of the Father, have received the love of the Father, we have to produce that love into fruit. I'm a branch that must bear fruit. By being attached to the vine, the fruit is what I need to think about and pray for and repent about and be changed for. And in that day, then we can enter the kingdom of the son he loves. Amen. Let's pray. We cannot live without Jesus. Not even a day. It's his love that gave me life 2,000 years ago. By believing, I received his love. But I still need him today. I need to hold on to him today. Even if my prayers are not answered. Even if things don't seem to go right. I must not doubt in his love. 
our desire is to never fade away from his memory. Think about that. Have you already been faded away in the memory of the Lord? Or is he still interested in you? Our fear is that we may fade away from his memory. Oh, Lord, I want to hold on to you. Please hold on to me. Let the Holy Spirit let hold on to me. Grab on to me so I don't let go. Let's lift up our hands and grab on to him. Make a fist, make fists, and hang on to him tight. Call on his name. Yes, you have. Yes, you have. Even if to this day as you've been hearing this message about fruit, and been feeling down because of a lack. I feel the same about myself. But while the Holy Spirit is preaching the message of repentance, we have chance. Still the Lord hasn't come back, we still have chance. When the Lord comes back, he will take this vine called the church. And when he comes back, am I going to be found as being attached as one, united as one with the body of Christ? Or still wandering off, half broken, half attached? Are you halfway? Are you half broken and half attached? Or are you fully, absolutely intact with the body of the Lord? Let's pray. I want to become one with your body. Stay one with the body no matter what. Please supply me with your blessing through cleansing, through the support of your word, of your life, and hold on to me until you come back so I may be lifted up to the air to see you and be with you forever. Pray. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Yes, you are.
hold me now. You hold me now. He's holding us now. It is his grace. He's holding us still now. We need to hold on to each other as well. Let's join hands with our brothers and sisters. We are like the grapevine that grows horizontally, hanging on to each other. Even if we may be different and sometimes unhappy about each other, we are in this together. Who else is going to hold on to you? It is only the body of Christ that will hold.